I'm Tim Herrera with the Sacramento County Office of Education here with another Teacher of the Year profile. We're speaking with Diane Boyd, who is an English teacher in the San Juan Unified School District at Mesa Verde High School. Congratulations and thanks for being with us. Thank you so much for having me, Tim. So tell us about what, what levels you teach. So last year I taught 9, 10, no, 10, 11, and 12, and next year I'll be teaching 10 and 11. Okay. So uh, as an English teacher, do you work to try to do kind of a combination of contemporary and classic? I do, and I think that the classic literature is super important because oftentimes when you're reading that literature, you can tie it into what's happening now. For example, last year we read The Crucible, and we talked about how it's an allegory, it was an allegory for McCarthyism, so it tied a little bit to the history, but then we said, okay, can we find evidence of similar targeting of people now, and uh, cases of, of um, that targeting of a, a particular group of people that's happening currently, and that was actually the source of the research project that my students did, they found, um, evidence of mob mentality, for example, or hysteria happening, and they brought that in and tied it to the crucible. And so when students are able to make that modern day connection, they get more invested in the topic. Absolutely, and they can see sort of the why. Why do we read these old pieces of literature? And, uh, and I say that's the reason that they're still popular, and that's the reason that why we still read them is because they have something to say, a timeless message. Uh, but then also, uh, I let them choose their own books that they read rather than, so The Crucible, for example, is the only common text that we read. I l allow my students to choose their own books. Uh, we call it accountable, independent reading and they choose their own books and they read them at their own pace and we do instruction with those so we teach all the elements and hit all the standards based on whatever book they're reading. And so when they're reading you're teaching them also about interpretation absolutely, and really uh, applying critical thinking skills mm -hmm. to un understanding not only just the words but what the words mean. Yep. So how do, you, how do you go about working with students to kind of have them open their minds a little bit to you know, different ideas, ideas that are, are foreign to them? It's a lot of asking questions. That's what I've learned in my many years of teaching is, it's not about me telling you what I know, it's about me asking you what you know. And students all have an opinion, it's just a matter of providing them the opportunity to share that opinion with others. And we do it with very low risk, you know, at first, write about it, write a little bit about it. Now share it with the guy next to you. Okay, now share it with the class. Now share it over here. And teaching them that whatever they have to say, their own opinion is valuable and that we want to hear it. And oftentimes students don't know what to do with that voice. And it's nice when they finally gain that confidence and that ability to stand up and share what they believe in. But I also teach them that they have to have factual evidence to back up their whatever it is that they're saying and we do a lot of analysis uh, rhetorical analysis of texts both old and new texts and and I ask them to be able to back it up with whatever they've found in the reading whether it's reading I've given them whether reading that they've that they've gotten from outside or a documentary they've watched or a podcast they've listened to and it allows them uh, to see how in order to share an opinion you, and be effective, you need to have some substantial evidence to back it up. Mm -hmm. and, and, and nowadays, in today's current culture, people make arguments with no evidence whatsoever. And we look yeah. at that yeah. all the time. Yeah. We'll watch a piece of news, some current event that's happening, or a student will bring in something and say, hey, Miss Boyd, we have to watch this or we have to read this. Uh, you can't believe what happened. And so we really do bring current events in, but we, again, we're, we're anchoring our approach to whatever it is that we're looking at to the Common Core State Standards. And, and students are able to see how, why, how are they able to, why do people believe them? How is this happening? And I know. And so you're also kind of teaching them media literacy by, by insisting that they find uh, solid foundational facts. Absolutely. And teaching them, you know, what's, how do you know that a source is credible? How do we know it? And we talk about some of the 
some of the sources that are out there that people often rely on and we look at, okay, does this slant one way or the other? And how, how can you read it with a critical lens so you can sort of take out the factual evidence and leave behind the you know, sort of the prejudice part of it. The opinion. Mm -hmm. So how important is it then uh, that you stay uh, brushed up on your professional learning? With media changing and uh, it, it must be, you really have to stay on top of things. You do, and, and it's exciting, and it's great, and it keeps me focused, and it keeps me energized, and uh, always learning. You know, we, we preach to students, you have to be lifelong learners, and I tell my students that all the time. I'll go to a training, and I'll come home, and I'll say, oh my gosh, this is what happened, this is what I learned, let me share this with you. Hey, I got this great idea idea for an activity, will you guys try it out with me? Let's see. And then afterwards, we'll, you know, we'll debrief it. And what went well? What do you think we could change? If I were to teach this again next year, what could I do differently? And so I, I ask my students to sort of jump on board with me in that risk-taking endeavor. But I absolutely think that professional development is so critical and, and meaningful if, if we take it seriously. Mm -hmm. So what are some things you do to motivate your students? You, you probably run into a student occasionally mm -hmm. who uh, you know can do a lot better. What are some things you do to kind of give them that little nudge? Like I said, giving them the voice, helping them understand that they have something to say and helping them develop that courage to say it. Uh, just a, a, a really silly activity that I do. I do a lottery and each class has a little uh, baggy and when a student does something well for example if, if I'm having a tardy issue everyone who's t on time will get a, a little lottery ticket you know and there it goes in the bag or if we're having a discussion and I'm at, and people aren't volunteering I'll start to give tickets to people who are volunteering so it's sort of that positive reward system even in high school you think that it'd be silly but but mm -hmm. students love it and then about once a month or so I will do a, a lottery and I bring in I call them fabulous prizes mm -hmm. and it can be anything from an extra hall pass because I only give them four hall passes to use for the semester or food teens love Food's food motivated. they love kids, food yeah. and so I'll bring in all kinds of, of treats and we do that and it just it kind of keeps kids a little bit motivated and and we determine ahead of time you know are we going to say you can only win four times? Are we going to say it's unlimited and I let them choose and it becomes a little battle and they vote and things. And so that's kind of one of those external motivators. But as far as just getting that kid who doesn't want to participate to participate, just being relentless. You mm -hmm. just can't give up. You just have to keep asking. Mm -hmm. And one day they'll eventually either get tired of you asking or gain some confidence and eventually share their ideas with you. So what inspired you to be a teacher? How did you get here? Well, when I was younger, I loved to be in charge. <laughs> um, my cousins are, are all laughing right now because I made them be my students. But I really wanted to go into law. And then when I got to UC Davis and started taking political science courses, I realized that I don't think I'm mean enough to be a lawyer, which I tell my students that and they laugh. Um, <laughs> but I was a cheerleader and I was asked to be uh, uh, to teach cheerleading camps during the summer and that was my first opportunity to get to a, uh, in front of a group of students and and I had four days to help them get better and I absolutely loved it and I loved the family that we built in that short little time of four days and in cheerleading I actually got to see visually very tangible evidence that they had grown and that they had learned and that I was able to help them do that. So I said, you know, maybe I should do this for like a career. And I took a year off after I graduated from Davis before applying to credential schools to be a substitute teacher because I really... It's a good introduction. Yeah, yeah, I really wanted to make sure that this was what I wanted. And it absolutely was. I taught in Dixon and Fairfield and Vallejo. And I really got a very broad... Um, experience with r the rural community and with an urban community and I said this is absolutely what I want to do and then here I am. And here you are today <laughs> as one of two teachers of the year for the San Juan Unified School District. Amazing. Congratulations to you. We've been speaking with Diane Boyd. Thanks Thank for joining so us. Thank you so much.